Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Welcome Lisa Brown to the Focus on Why podcast. Thank you, Amy. It's great to be here. It really is. And we're going to be talking about supported living amongst many things, I'm sure. There'll be your journey and all sorts. So Let's just start by what is it you're doing right now, Lisa? So I am a supported living property developer, I guess, is the, um, and for a lot of people, they won't know what that means. But it means that um, I develop properties for um, people who have support needs, a whole range of different support needs. But the ones I tend to specialise in in my own portfolio are people with um, complex learning disabilities. And what does a complex learning disability mean? So it means someone who has learning disabilities and maybe has some really complex behaviours and challenges with that. Um, so sometimes those properties need to be adapted to meet their needs. So maybe a standard family home wouldn't quite suit them. They need maybe something adapted to meet their needs and make it a bit safer for them. So, um, yeah, a whole range of different needs. That could be some physical disabilities tied in with that. It could just be the behavioural needs. And do they tend to be living with other people yeah there's a real mixed bag with supported living so some people live on their own and they have um, care and support staff living with them or you know on a shift basis not actually living with them but they'll be maybe need sometimes two um, care and support staff 24 hours a day Um, and then in other situations you may have a shared situation where someone um, maybe has a um, lives in a shared house with two or three or a larger number of other people and then they maybe have some support staff for a few hours a day really varies because there's such a range of needs so yeah wide wide spectrum of need and variation of property really and are there enough of these properties for the people who need it no it's a really big problem at the moment so um we we ended up setting up something called the supported living gateway because we've just found when i was talking to the providers the care providers the housing providers that they had a huge list of people who needed property needed property adapted for them people who were stuck in hospital um there's one young woman i know of who was discharged from hospital 12 months ago but she's still on an acute mental health ward because there isn't an appropriate accommodation for her to move into so for, uh, just as an example so there's a massive Massive need for them um, and then the, there is a, a really big need um, for property that's right for adapted and is right and and property people actually really like the idea of supported living when you get talking to people they go oh, I love the idea of doing that of making a home for someone that's a bit different and a bit safer and and people like I mean landlords get a terrible rep, rep rap reputation for being these bad evil people but actually when you're talking to the majority of property investors they love the idea of doing something a bit different of helping people and 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 going out of their way so um but they don't know how to do it they're a bit scared of it they're a bit unsure about how to get involved or how they would adapt a property or how would they actually have those conversations to find out what property is needed where that property is needed so we kind of ended up out of out of the work that I was doing and some of my other business partners were doing on their own, we kind of ended up coming together and forming this thing called the Supported Living Gateway, just a way to connect basically property people, care providers and housing providers and, and sort of bring everyone together on a platform to try and make um, make it easier for people to connect, ultimately to create more homes for people who need them, really. So, yeah. And how did it all manifest in the start? It's, well, my background's in nursing. <laughs> it's always a long story, isn't it? So I... Um, I was nursing for a long time. I worked in A&E. I worked, um, worked my way up to senior sister in the emergency department and emergency nurse practitioner. I did that for quite a long time. Then I did a bit of community nursing. And then um, we moved to Devon. And I really struggled to get senior nursing work around my children. I've got two lads. One of them's visually impaired. And, and childcare is always a little bit more complicated. So um, when I moved down here, I kind of naively thought, oh, I'll be able to get the right kind of role. And I just couldn't get a senior part-time job. And I just thought, actually, what am I going to do? It gave me a bit of time to rethink. And I decided that I would have a bit of a play doing some property. It sounds very grand and sounds, you know, but actually it was, it was just 
actually it was really interesting and I started learning about how you can invest with not a lot of money and how you can play around with it um did a whole load of learning did a couple of heritage flats that I really enjoyed and I've always loved old interesting buildings and I thought brilliant this is me this is it this is what I'm going to do is beautiful interesting buildings and then a kind of chance encounter led me to um this, I was asked if I could develop a bungalow for a young man with complex needs and um I thought oh that sounds interesting hmm. and I really loved doing that because it kind of used my nurse brain and my property brain combined I wasn't phased by being in care teams meetings discussing exactly what we needed to do with a wet room to make it safe for this young man and I, 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 I found it fascinating, but I ended up developing the most ugly pebble dash bungalow I was completely against the sort of thing I thought I'd be doing, but it's a really good property. You know, it's a really, really perfect property for this person by the time we'd finished with it. But in doing that bungalow, I encountered a whole load of challenges. I found it really hard to get the finance sorted on it. I found it really hard to, um, it was downvalued. The valuer didn't understand what we'd done to the property. There was a whole host of problems and I found it quite frustrating. And I, and I also felt like I was working on my own. I felt like if you're doing other property strategies for any of the other property investors listening, you'll know, you know, if you're doing HMOs, there's an HMO group and an HMO course you can go on and you can find information and talk to people about it. When you, um, you know, or student lets so or any, any of the property, standard property strategies, there's information and I found I just couldn't find anything about it. I found there was lots of big investment funds doing supported living um, on a huge scale, sort of pension funds, investment funds, but actually individual property investors. I was like, am I the only person in the country? I can't be. There are so many benefits to, as a property person to supported living, you know, that you've got a, a guaranteed, almost guaranteed income because it's government batch. You've got, you know, a tenant for life. This young man is probably, you know, this property is now the right property for him that we've developed. So he's going to be there probably, unless there was a dramatic change in his needs he'll probably be there for most of his life you know so why why aren't other property people doing this strategy what what's the barrier to it so I ended up setting up a Facebook group um think fully expecting someone to say oh Lisa there's this other group over here if you're not met have you not found it and um, we're now well over 2,000 members and um no there doesn't seem to be that other group around and it's been a great place to bring people together to talk about supported living about their experiences out of doing that, I started doing some interviews that I just called Lisa Live, not very imaginatively. Um, but it, it kind of was just, I streamed it into the Facebook group and it was just a way to talk to what other people, find out what they were doing, learn from their experiences and share it and just kind of raise awareness of this of this strategy, really. Um, and in, in doing that and connecting with so many more property people, I discovered, like I said earlier, so many people wanted to be part of it, but they just didn't know how to go about it. And I was having loads of phone calls with people going, how do I, how do I make these connections? How would, I in, how would I speak to them? How would I find what the need is in my area? And as my name got out more and more about the fact that I could develop properties for supported living, where down in the Southwest, I was getting phone calls from social workers, care teams, with all these heartbreaking stories about people who really needed property. And so I just, I, the, and then I found there were a couple of other people doing this and we got together and we talked about it and we decided to form the gateway and it's you know to try and solve that problem on, on a whole load of different levels and bring people together oh it's amazing lisa I and mean, what a great sort of journey that you've been through yourself from from being in that a and e all the way through now to sort of being a property developer what made you move from london to to devon oh um we'd always said that london was a really temp i met my husband in london he was a paramedic typically you know very bad 999 kind of <laughs> department <laughs> department romance kind of situation um you meet most early nurses are either going out with police officers or paramedics or firefighters because the only people you see anyway because <laughs> you're always at work anyway the um um yeah so we uh, we'd always planned that we'd bring our children up my husband always jokes up a mountain by the sea um and so it was always a short-term move where we were living and we kind of got stuck for a whole host of different reasons. But my older son was very unhappy at the school that he was at. And we just had a kind of, actually, why are we still here? We kind of stayed because we've got great, we had great friends where we were. We were very settled, but it felt like actually now is the time to move. And so we ended up in, in Devon, by a river, close to the sea, not quite up a hill, but not far from the moor. So we're nearly there. <laughs> That's great. And, and what is it you're focused on right now? What are you doing? So I suppose right now I'm doing um, 
in my own portfolio, we're developing an old social club into 13 flats for people with mental health challenges. So these are, um, so th the planning's just gone in. So hopefully by the time people listen to this, we'll have received planning for it. But yeah, so we're just, we're, that will be, um, there will be 13 flats, single one bed flats. 12 of those will be for tenants and one will be for a care support staff base. So we're developing that um, as a, scheme um, we've got really great connections with the local authority commissioner nhs and pulling all of that together so that's taken quite a lot of time to get that scheme off the ground and be involved in that and then the launch of the gateway by the time people again listen to this hopefully things will be further down the line but we've just been launching it this week and have been sort of doing some big webinars to to show people because we've been talking about it for a long time to show what actually we're going to be doing and you mentioned earlier that your your son was visually impaired. Do you think that inspires you to to do the work you're doing? I think there's a whole host of things. I think I've always had this thing that life is really precious and you just get one life and you need to do good with that life. I think partly when you work in A&E, when, uh, when you're, you know, when you're a student nurse from 18 and you, you're kind of, you're shaped and you experience those you see, you have the privilege of being with people who die, basically. You're there when people pass on, whether that is that they, it's a timely um, death and a timely peaceful death, or whether it's a horrible, unpleasant, um, painful, untimely death, you know, and, and it's a privilege, obviously, to be present at those moments of people's lives that are so, so crucial. I think that shapes you and it makes you really think about your day-to-day -day life. And I think it makes you think, actually... You, you stop taking things for granted because what's to say you're not going to be hit by that bus when you walk out your front door tomorrow morning because actually you see that kind of thing in your day-to-day -day work so I think that's always shaped me then um, my husband was called up to go to the second Iraq war we were newly married it wasn't expected at all it was a real kind of brown envelope on the doormat oh right okay fine <laughs> um, and that was very very unexpected and again that makes you stop and take stop taking things for granted at all because actually hang on he might not be here and we've just got married and this wasn't in our life plan at all that this was going to happen and then we had our younger son was diagnosed with the retinoblastoma which is um, eye cancer when he was three months old and again you have this precious tiny little bundle to be told that he's got cancer he looks well there's nothing wrong with him that I can see he's not focusing very well but you know it was a real shock and then for your very precious little baby to have to go through chemotherapy and operations every three weeks and all of the heartbreak and chaos that comes with a cancer diagnosis. I think, you know, all, all of that feeds into this kind of feeling that you you cannot take anything for granted. You have one life and you've got to just get on and, and grab it and use it and do what you're going to do with it, really. I remember a colleague of mine um, when I was nursing, um, saying to me, oh, you know what? I really hate this job. I absolutely hate it. I mean, she was so depressed about her work. I've only got 18 years till I retire. I've just got to stick it through. 18 years of your life doing something you hate. Oh, it's just, you know, that to me, that's really criminal. If, you, if something's not right, you've got to change it. And I understand people are trapped by financial situations, but, you know, you need to kind of grip your life, I think. Wow. So you've had your fair share of, of, of up and down roller coaster, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? Everyone gets thrown things in their life, don't they? You know, and you just have to get on and deal with them, really. But yes, yeah, it's been it's been eventful. <laughs> and how have you managed to deal with all of these sort of difficult moments? I suppose some people have that kind of why me philosophy and I've always felt that if you felt why me you're kind of expecting someone else to take that burden you know so the you can flip it around and say why not me actually you know why am I more privileged than someone else to not have that and actually maybe I'm in a position where I can deal with it, it doesn't feel like it sometimes when you're in the thick of it at all you know but I think there is an element that you just I think you have to be quite philosophical about life, don't you? And actually what, what is thrown at you, you do have to deal with. You just have to get on, dig in, cope with it. Something else will happen. And you kind of make your own destiny a little bit. And how have you sort of shaped that or come to that decision? What, what's helped you with your personal development? I don't know. I think I was, I think my mum has been a really big feature in this, in that she's been, I was brought up to be very, very pragmatic and very kind of, 
you just get on and deal with, um, you know, life's not fair, Lisa. That's why I was always told life's not fair, Lisa, get on with it. But, you know, that kind of philosophy and I think very much a coping, she's she's a fabulous, inspirational woman, my mum, and I think she very much led that kind of, this is how you get on and this is how you deal with life. And I think that has shaped me massively. And then I think your own experiences, you know, like I said, I think nursing and, and having those experiences and seeing such a range of society, meeting so many people, having the privilege to be pivotable, pivotal in people's lives at all kinds of really important points in their life. That shapes you as well. You know, having those experiences when you're younger as well. I think you, you grow up very quickly as a student nurse. So when you came down to Devon, you, you mentioned that you couldn't get a sort of a part time job in, in what you were doing. Mm. It seems such a shame that there's not that opportunity for sort of mums to, to be able to continue with their careers. Is that still the case now? I, I think it's just I think it's frustrating. I think there is a perception in some parts of I think of society that you can't do a fairly senior role part time. And I, I, I think, again, I, and I was really frustrated and really upset about it at the time because I felt like actually I'd poured myself into nursing. I was always going to be a nurse. I had never had any attention to not being a nurse. That was never part of my plan. And I felt quite let down that I couldn't get that role. But I also had enough self-worth and value to know that actually I wasn't going to take a very junior role and a very junior pay because I knew that I was better than that. I'd worked really hard to get to the positions I'd worked in. And actually I would needed, I wanted that recognition. I wasn't ready to go back to to being messed around as a as a junior member of staff. So I think um, I think it is it is really frustrating, and I think it's where big organisations shoot themselves in the foot by not recognising women and mothers returning to work and that need for part time work. I know when I was working part time that sometimes I'd be doing more in a say a six hour school day than my colleagues would be doing in their seven and a half hour day. I'd whiz in, I'd get it all done, I'd be out again, <laughs> and you know I found that you know and and then to not have that recognised and not you know. There are brilliant managers in the NHS as well. Absolutely brilliant managers who recognise things. And, and obviously there are less good like any big organisations. Yeah, I've always had a bit of a personal mantra. So what to do between 10 and 2 or or who to be between 9 and 3. You know, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, I just it's been a frustration for me personally to, to have not found something for 12 years, before, you know, while the kids were at sort of junior school and then going in their early years. And I just and I just didn't realise that the property was a great solution and that, that it was staring me in the face because I'd already done at, by that point a couple of sort of really big refurbishments for my own homes, not even thought about taking it into sort of an investment perspective. How did you ar- sort of arrive at property as being a solution? It's exactly that, to be honest. When I look back, I realise we've done that by refurbished refinance model on our own houses since we bought our house in our first house in London in like 2000. You know, so, but I didn't realise it was a strategy. I didn't know I was doing anything clever I just thought well we could afford that house and then I could do that to it and make it work um and I think I've always been able to see the um potential in property and you realize that actually particularly actually when I'm taking care staff and care teams around properties now to view and see if they're suitable for someone you realize how actually that ability to work out what this property could be like is something that not everyone has. And I kind of assumed everyone could think in that way. You know, I'll take care staff around, oh, we can't use this one because it's in a really terrible state, Lisa. Well, no, that's what I want because we're going to rip it out and make it work. <laughs> you know, oh, no, but it's got this big garage. Yeah, but we'll we'll take that garage out and we'll convert that into the staff suite. Oh, OK. You know, so so I think, yeah, I, I did that without realising it was a strategy with property. I've always loved buildings. I've always been, my sister jokes, I've always been looking in the state agent window since I was tiny before Right Move existed. I was always kind of like, you know, in the dark old days when you had to actually go and look in windows. Um, <laughs> and... So I've always had that natural fascination and I've always, and I thought to start with that I would just buy a holiday let, that'd be my plan. I thought, well, where we live is really lovely. You know, I could run a holiday let. And when I started running the figures on it, I th- couldn't quite see how I could make that work. It seemed a bit riskier. And then I started listening to loads of podcasts because there's so much information out there for free, isn't there? And read a few books and thought, oh, actually, maybe I could do this. And, and that's where I ended up developing the flats. Just, you know, it was just a house divided into two flats and really enjoyed that. So, so now with your community of over 2000 people, which is just incredible, what are people doing? What, what, have you, what stories can you share of how they've transformed other people's lives? There's so many inspirational stories in there. And, 
it's you know people who are, are converted it's also there's people who've got amazing um ideas and plans for things and changing communities and coming up with things there's there's a really great organization who house homeless people they're called Rene House in Nottingham I was just making sure I got the right name so they house people who've been street homeless and they put them into small properties two three bed properties because they don't they think it works better and it does that all their evidence is that it really does so they do some really inspirational work with transforming people and getting them off the streets and getting them set up so they can take on their own tenancies. So there's these great projects that are going on all over the place. People developing houses and properties for care leavers, so teenagers who've been in the care system who need that support to transition. And anyone who's a parent knows a teenager isn't a finished product, although they still need a lot of support and love until they could take on their own tenancy. But unfortunately, if you've been in the care system, you can end up not having that support to transition to adulthood in the way maybe someone who has their full family around them would be able to. So setting up a decent home where people can learn those support skills and, and can learn how to do simple things for themselves so that they can move and transition to take on their own tenancy. Um, so there's people who help with those sort of transitional models where people go through. And then there's the long term stuff where people are developing properties that will be someone's home for life. Someone who has needs that are not going to change. Their needs will always be there. So therefore, they need to have a property that will suit their needs and be safe for them. I if I talk about the bungalow that we developed to start with, the young man who was moving into there was... Um, had the very complex and quite challenging behaviours. The support staff were finding him quite hard to manage. Since we've moved him into the property and it's been developed specifically for him, I bumped into a member of the care staff and they said his behaviour is so much calmer, he's so much more settled, he's easier to manage from their point of view, but it means he's also happier because he's in the right environment for him. He, you know, he's, he's somewhere that suits him and somewhere where he can be calm and probably where he feels safe, you know. And we had the privilege of meeting his mum. His mum came and looked at the property before just before he moved in when it was finished and she just burst into tears when she saw the property and she said Lisa I never thought my son would have somewhere like this to live I never thought he would have a place like this that would be his own and that's yeah it just made me <laughs> burst into tears the great big burly builders who'd be working around the block because this young man was being evicted from his home so we had a real deadline to get it finished so the big guys that I'd been working with are all in tears behind her <laughs> listening to her say it but that's that's what it's about isn't it it's about actually you can invest in property and it can be a good business model but actually it can also do good at the same time it's like the ultimate win-win situation and if you cast your mind back to when you're asked to do, do that development on the pebble dash bungalow and, <laughs> and the not very exciting project what if you hadn't have been asked would you be doing all of this no no it's so funny isn't it so it's that kind of like chance encounter that led to that and that's what when you look back on your life you can see all of these little pivotal crossroad moments can't you that make a difference and if I'd have done this this wouldn't have happened and yeah absolutely um but yeah I'm so pleased I did it was it was brilliant and I'm so lucky that I, I got the opportunity to do that because it then led to all of this this thing so with the gateway you're providing an opportunity for people to understand exactly how they can be involved in providing supported living it's basically oh sorry Amy. no 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 sorry <laughs> So it's basically like a matchmaking service. So basically people can say, I have this property and, and put it in front of a lot of care providers and housing providers. And those providers can then say, oh, that's exactly what we need. We've got this referral for this person here. That property would match. Ding, we've got a match. So it's, it's, it's basically as simple as that. Through it, we're offering other services to property people because we realise that there's so little understanding of it it is quite complex to get your head around some of the terms the understanding so if you want to do a deeper dive into it we're offering some training and we're offering some webinars and and bits and pieces to help you kind of be more aware and understand what it is so you can simply just put a property on and go for that matchmaking service or if you want to do that deeper dive into it you can then um, sign up for that as well so, so it's both things but it's just basically making it easier for care providers you know when we were speaking to providers i was speaking to um uh someone uh, this really inspirational man who set up an addiction charity and he runs large shared houses has this great sort of peer support model within the shared houses to help people overcome their addictions but he'd spent two days 
on Zoopla, on Rightmove, phoning letting agents, trying to find a property that would suit him. He's like, I just can't find anything suitable because he doesn't speak the right language to explain to letting agents, actually, that's a really good deal that he's offering this package. They'll have guaranteed rent. They won't have to look after their property. It's a, you know, it's a really good package, but actually letting agents and landlords who don't understand the model would say, oh, I'm not quite sure about people like that in my house. I'm not sure. Whereas actually, if you can switch it around and say, yeah, but from an investment point of view, it's a brilliant model. You'll get your property handed back to you in the same condition or better often than you've let it. Um, it just seemed wrong that the providers were spending time trying to find property. It's like this missing piece of a puzzle that is there for them. I've, you know, a lot of them have got, we've got this huge demand list of property that's needed. We've got people who need have everything else they've got the referral they've got the tenant they've got the care package they cannot find the property to suit them you know and that demand is is big there's a lot of people still stuck in institutions there's a big move away from institutional care in this country which is good it's you know what we should be looking at personalized individualized care if you think of it as a family member of yours you would want them to be cared for in their own home in somewhere they felt safe in their community around the corner from you around the corner from their mum somewhere they could walk to the shop you don't want someone stuck in an institution in a big old stately home in the back of somewhere where they can't be seen. You know, that's not how society should be these days, is it? And this podcast goes out to tens of countries, so about 55 when we're recording this. Wow. Um, so is this a case in other countries as well? Do you know much more about that? I think there is a move to supported living in different countries. I think the model is different and the funding structure is probably very, very different because obviously not everyone has a publicly funded sort of health and care system in the way that ours is funded. So I think it is different in different places, but I know that the model is replicated in other countries too. Yeah. I'm just wondering if people are listening to this and they're thinking, oh my gosh, that would be amazing for mm. us to do that in the yeah. country that we're in then there's definitely a conversation to be had to get the basics understood yeah. and then yeah. they can then find out you know how they can work out the funding and, and yeah. how the matchmaking there so yeah absolutely it's it is it's needed and I think it's it's about people having the right life isn't it it's about people having the right opportunities regardless of their disability or where they've come from it's making sure people have support to either transition to taking their own tenancies or to be able to stay somewhere and feel safe and secure. Well, you said it earlier, Lisa, you said that every day is so precious and that we shouldn't take things for granted. Mm. And yet, you know, so many people do. Yeah. Yeah. People kind of sleepwalk through their lives, don't they? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I talk about this a lot. I talk about the difference between living and existing. So, mm. you know, you're not talking about supported existing. You're talking about supported living yeah. so that they actually live a life which, you know, is enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's it's about people regardless yeah people just being happy settled calm and and being able to do the best that they can do part of that is making sure they've got the right care package as well and all of that but as a property person you're simply fitting one piece of that puzzle and that's the, the property piece to to bring to that party well, Lisa, it's been a whirlwind of a, an episode. This one, I feel like I, I've been up and down. I don't, you, you, you almost got me crying earlier, but I was like, hold it together. <laughs> but, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that sit and watch DIY SOS and just sort of sat there streaming. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> So yeah, I just hold it together for now, but I can have a little tear later. But no, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us the incredible work that you're doing and that you've set up to make it available for so many more people. It's just absolutely admirable. It's fantastic. How will people get in contact with you? Um, I suppose to connect with me through LinkedIn. I'm sure you can put our contact details in the bottom as well, can't you? So it'll be in the show notes. But um, yeah, LinkedIn yeah. will be the best way to connect with me on social media. Um, oh, obviously you can find this supported living gateway on social media too. Fantastic. Well, I'll make sure all the links are in the show notes. So if you want to connect with Lisa, please do so. Lisa, have you got a final message for the audience, please? I guess it's that you just have one life. It's very, very precious. You need to live it and you need to do good with it. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson, and if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. 
If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20 minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.